I'm going to try an experiment. First, um, for those of you who know me, there will be no PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to talk from my seat, and I have a watch in front of me, so I'm going to stop in 10 minutes. So um, a, a few comments in general. Uh, going to Forgive me, I'm stray a little bit off script. From, from, but um, with regard to climate change and the science about it, things of that nature, it is indeed settled that the climate's changing. It's largely caused by humans. Beyond that, it's not settled. Let me give you one example. It's only in the last five years that we're discovering that uh, there may be a solution to a long-standing dilemma. What was the dilemma? 120,000 years ago, the last warm period, uh, we were about one degree hotter than we are today. The fossil record shows the sea level was, guess how much higher than today? I will. It's a quiz, I'm a professor, but uh, we don't have time for grading, so I'll tell you the answer. It's six to nine meters higher. Six to nine meters, not centimeters, meters higher. Only one degree hotter, which was the Paris goal. The dilemma was, well, our common models weren't actually telling us this. Our glacial models weren't actually telling us this. So what's going on? History was telling us this. And history, in this sense, is, I think, a better predictor than where we are today in, in the climate world. And it's only in the last five years that we're beginning to see, number one, satellite measurements are saying, oops, we got that wrong. The glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica, the glaciers in Antarctica 10 years ago were expected to be actually increasing, but they're decreasing. And some of them are decreasing at a rate that is astounding. Kilometer per year, glacial runoff in Western Antarctica. Not a centimeter, 10 centimeters per year. And so this is recent satellite data, recent measurements, only in the last couple of years. The, the, the climate community is still digesting this, let alone the public. So when I hear people say, let's decide what to do, and then, and then after that we can decide what, well, we're not even deciding now where we're heading. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is going to need constant evaluation. When I was Secretary of Energy, uh, EPA saw this also, NASA saw this, NOAA saw this constant efforts to defund anything that had to do with climate measurement. Another uh, fact. Okay, so um, in terms of things of where we want to go, there's another thing that I should tell people. This is good news. Um, clean energy is actually getting much cheaper than even I, as a perennial technical optimist, thought was going to be. It's hard to, in the United States to disentangle the production tax rate from wind, which is now about two, two and a half cents a kilowatt hour in contracts, but, but we have a production tax rate. We have an investment tax credit, solar, 30 percent. It's hard to disentangle that. So I look to the south. Mexico had its first energy auctions. Uh, it's a new change of the Constitution. It was no longer a government monopoly. And so people, investors can come in and they say, we can put up a wind farm, we can put up a solar farm, you pay us a certain rate, the, all profit included, we'll sell you electricity at a certain cost. The cost was about four cents a kilowatt hour without the mandates in both solar and wind. Four to four and a half cents a kilowatt hour, no production tax credit, no investment tax credit, no renewable portfolio standard. It's just money, including profit. This is pretty good news. And this is the best way to actually back out what the subsidies are. What, is the other, what are other economies close by with great wind, great solar, the way we have? So that's also good news, but there's a lot of misinformation being played out as how it's really more expensive than that. So, so there's a lot of things um, that can be done. Now, I am going to return to script a little bit uh, uh, and what the agencies can do. But one more slight correction about what's been said. We saw a graph where uh, the former head of the CEQ showed uh, uh, a graph of you start with federal research, it's uh, uh, federally supported research, you walk down, you get investment opportunities and in invest in VCs and it goes up the ladder. Except that's generally true, but I want to make one small correction. Uh, if you pick a technology, any technology, it implies that there's a time where research actually appropriately sunsets, it, all the research is being done, it's done. 
Uh, and that is simply not true. When I see people, uh, for example, uh, they talk about carbon capture. They have assumptions there. We can capture carbon at a certain price, a certain parasitic load, 25 percent. I'm quoting from memory the slide I saw. Uh, certain costs, things of that nature. Actually, number one, without carbon capture, we are going into the technical physics word is deep doo-doo. <laughs> um, because it's not only carbon capture from coal, but it's carbon capture from every point emitting source, cement, steel, coal, natural gas, oil refining, you name it. Uh, you've got to capture the carbon. The price is not there yet. And oh, by the way, even if it may be acceptable to certain segments of the world population, it's, if it's not acceptable to India and China, it's not going to work. And so I think there's a great deal of research that can be done. There's great opportunities scientifically, but the things we're piloting today are not going to make it. And so I think the emphasis on keeping alive the research uh, to actually drive down the cost. Batteries, another great example, electric vehicles. You know, we have the Tesla, great shiny example. The Tesla Model 3, start, starting at 35,000, really it's going to start about 45,000 for the first couple of years of cars they sell. Uh, but, it, but when it gets to 20, 25,000, then it becomes mass market and it's not even going to be a debate anymore. You need a new generation of batteries. Not the ones that Gigafactory is going to build, but a new generation of different chemistry batteries. The probability of that happening, who can say, but I would guess within a decade we will have that which means another four or five years of safety testing. Uh, so, so the role of research uh, is incredibly vital to continue to drive down the cost to make clean energy the low cost option and make it further the low cost option because it actually has to overcome the built in infrastructure and inertia that we have. So it's not a matter of reaching cost parity, it's also a matter of overcoming the inertia with uh, such strong economic incentives uh, without subsidy, where I think it's going to really win the day. Now, regarding what uh, the topic of this conversation, cabinet agencies and, what, and what, how can they help, there are many, many government cabinet agencies that overlap in the question of uh, in the environment, climate, energy. Uh, and that is part of the issue that no one, there's no single ownership. There's EPA, there's DOE, there's uh, interior, there's agriculture, and there are agencies like NASA and NSF. Um, we have in our system of government checks and balances. But since we have so many agencies that overlap this, one thing I learned in Washington is, again, as a physicist, you look for generally applicable rules, a few things. Unless continually push, things come to a halt. Newton was wrong, Archimedes was right. The friction in government is immense. You get more friction if there are more agencies involved. Do you have super agencies? Uh, there was an attempt with President Obama with uh, Carol Barner's office. Uh, to try to do something like that. There was CEQ, which is another attempt to try to do anything. But in the end, the agencies with the budgets actually have a voice. And if you can't bring the agencies with the big budgets along, having um, a convener within the White House doesn't work as well. Now, I personally think my advice to the next president would be, depending on who becomes in the cabinet in these agencies, you say, okay, this cabinet member takes the lead on this period, end of story. Talk about uh, transmission lines, uh, many agencies, Interior, uh, FERC, Department of Energy. No one was taking the lead. Uh, there was meetings, half a dozen meetings at CEQ. Finally, Ken Salazar, who was directly uh, very much along similar lines, wanting to do something, he says, I remember there was a law passed when I was a senator that says if the Department of Energy wants the authority to side transmission lines, uh, they can have it. And I said in the meeting, okay, I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> and then an hour later, just kidding, because Fish and Wildlife put so much pressure, they said, no, 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 no. We, you know, even within Interior, 
there are conflicting agencies. Fish and Wildlife don't want any transmission lines anywhere near their jurisdiction, whereas other parts of Interior wanted them. And so again, I think, and uh, another story, NIST. NIST um, and Department of Energy says we want to get interoperability standards for smart grid transmission distribution just so things could talk to each other. Just, just the communication standards. We had a forum, a workshop. We wanted to throw the people in the room, the major players, uh, throw them pizza or whatever they wanted, salad or whatever, and, and, until they came up with uh, standards. Uh, because if the government came up with standards, it would take five years of, of all the, you know, the to and froing and the government regulations. Uh, we couldn't get that done. It, we, there was an attempt to do that. And so again, I think the president actually has incredible power. I'll end by saying that how I was so impressed when I saw this movie Lincoln. It might not be true at all, <laughs> but what, where Abraham Lincoln says, the president is cloaked in immense authority. And the president actually can do a lot in order to get the agencies to play. The president working with Congress, if it's going to be a, a Abraham Lincoln or Lyndon Johnson, good. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let's have the president do that. Congress has to step up to the plate and realize that uh, there is all this information out there. You talk about adaptation, and one final comment, and I'm one minute over, but um, one final comment is something um, that I just heard in the last panel. Um, the government has lots of information. The, getting that information out, and in particular, the cost of adaptation the cost of fighting extended fires and fire seasons, the cost of flood control, the cost of cop failures. The federal act government, actually, we're working with the states, can actually gather that information, just post it. And these costs are really hidden from the American public. You know, we're, we were hemorrhaging every time there's a Katrina or Sandy, we're $23, $25 billion in debt from flood insurance. Another big one, we just ratchet up another one. And so these are costs that are part of adaptation and that will help us appreciate how do you going to do the adaptation and the mitigation because it's something that in the end not only the American taxpayers but the world will pay for.